Hi everyone and welcome to this video on anemia. In this particular video we're going to go through a few things. Firstly we'll get a definition of what anemia, what the term actually means. The physiology, so we'll basically go back to how red blood cells are produced and how do they then mature and go into the blood. Clinical signs, so how typically in the clinical setting would you see anemia presenting? Then we'll have a look at the common causes. So if we were to categorize anemia into three main causes, being their loss, production, destruction issues, that's how we classify the causes of anemia. And then finally, exploring them. How do we explore what is actually causing the main problem? And we can do this through the size of the red blood cell. So that's what we'll be covering today for this particular video. So firstly, let's grab a definition. What does anemia actually mean? Well, the term directly or literally means without blood. But we know that that's not really the case with anemia. You don't have any blood, that's not true. There's essentially something wrong with the red blood cell. So the definition of anemia, you could say, is a reduction in the oxygen carrying capability of the blood. Now, if we were to look at the blood, because it's going to be carrying the oxygen for us. We know that oxygen is important to be taken to our tissues, our cells in the body. 30 trillion cells need oxygen to make ATP. Blood carries it. Now, of the blood, 98% of oxygen is carried on red blood cells. So therefore, we know that red blood cells are going to be vitally important. So if we look at the direct count, how many red blood cells do we have in the body? Well, here I've got a table, which is the adult reference range of blood for females and males. Let's start off with the red blood cell count. So how much red blood cells, how many red blood cells do we have in the body? Well, for females, approximately 3.8 to 5 million red blood cells per microliter of blood. Males, a little bit more, 4.2 to 5.6 million. So let's just say 5 million. So we have 5 million RBCs per microliter. To get that to mils, we times it by a thousand. So that means we have five billion red blood cells per mil. Now we need to change mils to liters. So again, we'll times it by a thousand. So now we have five trillion RBCs per liter, and we have about five liters of blood in the body. So let's just say we have 20 trillion RBCs in the body. So that's a lot. That's about 60% of all the cells in your body, because we've got about 30 trillion cells, about 60% of all the cells in your body are red blood cells. So what's this telling you? Vitally important cell to carry oxygen. If we have a reduction in red blood cells over here, so if you were to take your, person, your patient's blood and you had a reduction in RBCs, that would lead to anemia. But let's just not stop there. What is it about red blood cells that carry the oxygen? We know that they are filled. Here's a red blood cell here. It's a bioconcave shaped cell. It's really got no organelles in it. It's just jam packed with something called hemoglobin, Hb. Hemoglobin, how many hemoglobin mo molecules per RBC? Well, there are about 250 million. 250 million molecules of hemoglobin per red blood cell. Now in terms, so these are going to be carrying oxygen. Now in terms of where in the hemoglobin does it carry oxygen? Well, we have a molecule or we actually have four molecules per hemoglobin, which we call heme, H-A-E-M. Heme is basically this polyphorinic ring with, with iron attached to it. So a polyphorin ring with iron attached to it. So there's iron is where the actual oxygen binds. So there's actually four spaces where oxygen binds per hemoglobin. That means four times 250 million, there's actually 1 billion oxygen sites where oxygen can, can bind per red blood cell. So that's telling you there is a lot of oxygen carrying capabilities by your red blood cells. So if we have a reduction in hemoglobin, come across here, here's your hemoglobin. We've got approximately 12 to 15 grams of hemoglobin per 100 mils of blood for females or 13.2 to 16.7 
grams per 100 mils of blood for males. So if there's a reduction in hemoglobin, we would also develop anemia. So if there was, you may have normal amounts of red blood cells, but the amount of hemoglobin in the red blood cell is less, that would also result in hemoglobin, sorry, in anemia. So therefore, the definition of anemia is really the reduction in oxygen ca carrying capabilities of the body, which could be a drop in red blood cells, or it could be a reduction in hemoglobin per red blood cells. That is the definition of anemia. Let's move to the physiology. So how do we make these red blood cells? So let's go to bones. Bones is the location in our body where we make red blood cells, where we actually make all the cells for our blood. So the red marrow in bones is where we do so. Here we have a special group of stem cells called a hemopoietic stem cell. And these stem cells are basically, they can make all the lineages of blood cells in the body. They can make white blood cells, they can make platelets, they can make red blood cells. So they are a type of stem cell that are what we call pluripotent. They can make a lot of things. So I'll just call this a pluripotent stem cell. There are millions of these in your bone marrow. They just constantly replicate, replicate, replicate. So they keep the number of stem cells in their bone, but they then pr produce the lineage that we, they want to make. So you make, may want to make red blood cells. They may want to make platelets. They may want to make white blood cells. So this is happening all the time. In terms of red cells, these guys are making 2 million red cells per second in the body through all your bone marrow. So they are very busy. How do they get told to make red cells? Well, we actually need a stimulation from the kidney and that's by a hormone called EPO. So the kidney needs to produce this to tell this stem cell or these stem cells, we need to make red blood cells. So EPO, erythropoietin, needs to be sent from the kidney via blood to your bone marrow to tell it to go down a lineage to make red blood cells. Now in the early phase of the immature red blood cell, this would be essentially a pro-urethrocyte or a pro-urethroblast. Urethro just means red blast. So this is an immature red blood cell. Now to get from the pro-urethroblast, which is in the bone, to get to a fairly immature red blood cell we call a reticulocyte, they need to go through a number of steps. They need to produce the hemoglobin, that 250 million molecules per red blood cell. So they're gonna be very busy. So they need to make hemoglobin. So they need to have all the ingredients for that to make the hemoglobin, they need iron, they need B12, they need B9, and they need a whole or amino acids to make the protein. So they need a lot of ingredients, okay? And then once they get to the point where they are ready to make almost the mature red blood cell, they need to get rid of their DNA. So they need to condense the DNA, get smaller as a cell. So they actually start as a big cell and they get smaller and smaller and smaller, condense the DNA, pop out the DNA and then they mature into red blood cell. So the reticulocytes, just before the reticulocyte step, they need to condense their DNA and get rid of it. Because remember the red blood cell is just a package of hemoglobin. To do this step, to go from an immature bigger cell to a smaller packed cell, they need to have lots of B12 and B9. And that's important to condense the DNA and get rid of it. If we run out of that, this might cause a problem. So any issue here in the production level, any problem here could present with types of anemia. Then the reticulocyte, which we can actually measure in the blood. So these reticulocytes do get pushed off into the blood now where they spend a couple of days, maybe two, two days where they finally mature into a red blood cell. We can actually measure the reticulocytes over here and the reticulocyte count should be about 0.5 to 1.5 or 2% of all your red blood cells should be in this kind of immature form, the reticulocyte form. If we were to take an overall count of red blood cells to your whole blood, this would give us something called hematocrit, which tells us the percentage of red cells to total blood. And as you can see here, for females, it's approximately 35 to 44% of your blood are red blood cells, or in males, 38 to 48% of 
your whole blood are red blood cells. So that's the hematocrit. So if this number was to go down, that would also be indicative of anemia. Finally, one measurement we can do is we can actually look at the size of the red blood cell when it is mature. And this is what we call the MCV or the mean corpuscle volume, the size, the volume of the red blood cell. And this should be in the range of 80 to 97, 80 to 97 femtoliters, which is just the size of the red blood cell. And that will become important when we explore the causes of it. So therefore, that's going to be the production. That's how we make new red blood cells. As I said, you're making 2 million red blood cells per second. So this is a very busy process. Now let's go and explore. If we were to have a problem here, if we were to see that your patient did have anemia, so they had either a drop in hemoglobin or a drop in red blood cells, which then would be a drop in hemoglobin, how would we see it? What would you see in your patients? The first thing over here, we saw that red blood cells are very important for carrying oxygen. Oxygen needs to be delivered to the cells to make ATP. If you don't have enough oxygen, you're not going to get a lot of, you're not going to make efficiently a lot, enough ATP. So you would be tired, you would be weak, you would be fatigued. So one of the early signs is not a lot of energy because you can't make your ATP. The body would try to counter this by bringing blood to the central system, diverting it away from the periphery. So you would develop, your patient would develop pallor. They would look pale, their hands would be cold because they are vasoconstricting. The body would try to compensate, we're building up the heart rate, speeding up the heart rate to try to get more blood around the body. So heart rate would get go up. And particularly when you exert yourself, you would develop dyspnea or shortness of breath. So the patient would be short of breath. They feel like they can't get their breath, particularly when they do something. So shortness of breath is also very common. Now, in some causes of anemia, it can be through the destruction of the red blood cell, which we call hemolysis. If the red blood cells are being killed off in high amounts, when we spoke about the heme, the heme, when, we, when red blood cells die, because they only last 120 days in the body, they have to be recycled. So they get recycled in the spleen or the liver and the heme component need to be recycled into bilirubin and then packaged up in the liver to be excreted safely. But if, it is, if this process is too high and it kind of overwhelms the liver, it could cause the person to get jaundice because the heme or the bilirubin is actually a yellow pigment. So if we have too much red blood cell destruction, the heme amount actually goes up, overwhelms the liver, and you can actually see this on the person. So their eyes or their skin may start to yellow and that's called jaundice. But that would only be caused by the destruction or increase in destruction of red blood cells. So that's the common clinical signs that you may likely see in a physical examination of your patient. Let's now look at the common causes. So these are the way we can categorize all anemias based on their mechanism. Firstly, and this is fairly obvious, if you were to just lose whole blood. So if your patient was to get an acute bleed, hemorrhage, such as internal bleeding or external bleeding, we just lose whole blood. If you lose the whole blood, let's say a liter, two liters of blood, and you replace that with just IV fluids like normal saline, you are essentially diluting the blood out. So that hematocrit will start to drop because less of the blood is now red blood cells. So that number goes down. So does the red cell, so does the hemoglobin. So we actually get anemia through whole blood loss. Okay. Now, if it's very acute, we wouldn't see a change in the reticular sites. That's the immature cell because the bone marrow hasn't been instructed to um, compensate for this loss quick enough. It will take a few days to compensate. So it may take five days until you see the stem cell being told to produce more red blood cells through the EPO from the kidney. And we wouldn't see this through a bill, an increase in reticular sites in the blood because we've had an acute blood loss. So blood loss is the first cause, category of cause, of anemia. The next is a production issue. So this essentially is fits into this part here. If we have a problem producing the red blood cell or producing the hemoglobin, like we run out of the products, we will develop 
a reduction in probably hemoglobin, therefore anemia. So if there's a problem with producing red cells or the hemoglobin, we would develop anemia. And then finally, we have the destruction of the red blood cells. So this can be further categorized into two, what we call intrinsic or extrinsic. What that means is if there is something intrinsically wrong with a red blood cell. So in its, the way it's produced, it's their deficiencies. It could be a deficiency in the membrane. So the membrane has a problem such as spherocytosis. So instead of being a bioconcave shape, there's something wrong with the membrane and it looks like a big circle. That then, it doesn't work efficiently and it is killed off by macrophages because it can't fit through um, capillaries well. So the, the macrophages in the spleen and the liver actually kill it off. But intrinsically, there's a, something wrong with the membrane. Intrinsically, you could have a problem with enzymes in the red blood cell. For an example, there is an enzyme in the red blood cell called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Basically, that's important for regulating the free radicals in the red blood cell. If that enzyme is deficient, the red blood cell also, its uh, ability, the way it functions is diminished and that can also lead to its destruction because it, it can't adapt well to free radicals. A third type is a haemoglobin problem. And so the way that the haemoglobin is packaged is deficient, such as sickle cell anemias, and that leads to their destruction, which we call hemolysis. The other type are intrinsic causes. So this is not the fault of the red blood cell. Something extrinsic to it is leading to its destruction. An example would be autoimmune. So your immune system, for whatever reason, sees the red blood cell as foreign and just leads to an, an antibody-led destruction. So that's from the immune system, not the fault of the red blood cell. There could be mechanical issues in the body. So if you were to have problems in the valves of your heart, such as aortic stenosis, and the way that the blood is pushed out of the aorta, it's reduced and caused mechanical damage to the red blood cell, that could lead to their death and that's a mechanical injury. Another type would be, say, malaria. Malaria from mosquitoes is a parasite that actually goes into the red blood cell, which can then lead to their destruction. Again, hemolysis, but it's actually the malaria, it's the infection that leads to it, which is extrinsic to it. It's not the fault of the red blood cell, so we call that an extrinsic cause. So these are the three main causes, category causes, of anemia. What we can do now is try to explore how do we find out what the actual cause is. So what we can do is if we've established that the patient has anemia, so they've got clinical signs of, we see that they've got a reduction in hemoglobin and red blood cells, we can then explore what could be the problem. So what could be done is you take blood, you do a blood smear and you look down the microscope at how big the red blood cell. And this gives us the categories of anemia based on the size of the red blood cell. So if the red blood cell is in the normal range, so if the normal range from a volume size is between 80 to 97, so I'll just put it here, 81 to 97 femtoliters, if we had a reduction in red blood cells or hemoglobin, but the size of the red blood cell was normal, we call this a normocytic, a normocytic anemia, which means the red blood cells are normal size, normal volume, but there is a reduction in hemoglobin or red blood cells. So that's a normocytic category. If we go to the other end, this is a small size, so this would be they're smaller than 80 femtoliters, these are what we call microcytic, small, microcytic. And then on the other end, where they are larger than 100 femtoliters, this is what we call macrocytic. Now let's quickly see what are the most common examples for each. Microcytic, essentially the fundamental problem here is in the production of the hemoglobin. So the two most common problems in the production of the hemoglobin is a production in the heme and the globulin. 
or the globin. So the heme, what we saw is the polyforin ring with the iron. So the most common example of a heme production problem is iron deficient anemia. So iron deficiency anemia basically means when the cell is trying to mature and jam pack all the cell with its hemoglobin, it's running out of iron. So why would you, what would cause a reduction in iron in the person's body? Well, there could be a couple of steps where there are problems. There's either not enough intake into the body, and so this could be through diet. Certain people may not have much iron in their diet, such as vegans or vegetarians, so that could be one issue. We could get a loss of iron, so this is usually through blood loss, so through menstruation or ulcers in the stomach or um, bleeding from cancers, bowel cancers, which are usually slow bleeds, not fast bleeds that we saw in the acute hemorrhages. So slow bleeds, which means we lose the storage of iron in the body, leading to a deficiency. So we've got not enough intake, we've got loss, we could have an increase in use of iron in the body. An example there would be pregnancy, or we could have a reduction in iron absorption. This could be a problem with the stomach or certain higher uh, intestinal issues such as in the duodenum, and that could be from celiac disease. So that could lead to iron deficiency anemia. Now, because we're running out of iron in the production, we're gonna put less hemoglobin per red blood cell. So because we're jam packing less hemoglobin per red blood cell, the cells actually become smaller. We have less hemoglobin per red blood cell. So there might be, the number might be okay. So the red blood cell, cell number might be okay, but the hemoglobin number will drop because we're putting less hemoglobin in that because we've run out of iron. The example of a globulin deficiency, this could be a condition called thalassemia. Thalassemia, well, in, globulin, in, in the globulin chain, which is the protein, there are two forms of the protein. There's the alpha form and the beta form. In its production, if there's a genetic abnormality which leads to a change in the protein, the type of thalamus, thalassemia could be a problem with the alpha or beta chain. So usually the category of thalassemias could be alpha thalassemias or beta thalassemias. Now, depending on how many globulin chain is the problem, so this is based on the genetics, how many gene deficiencies there are would determine how severe the thalassemias is. So the thalassemia, again, is a problem with the hemoglobin. Again, because we're having a dysfunction in the packing, the cell would put less hemoglobin into it. Therefore, the overall cell is reduced. Now, let's go across to the macro. The macro actually comes about more from the maturation of the immature red blood cell into the mature red blood cell. So this has to do more with the way that we condense the DNA, package it up, and get rid of it. So the two most common macrocytic anemias is a deficiency in B12 and B9, or folic acid. So these, again, come from the diet. So they're going to be similar in certain ways to iron deficiency anemias. B12 can only come about from animal products. So very strict vegans that don't take B12 as supplements may have a reduction in B12 in the body. That's going to change the way that B12 impacts the way that DNA condense, and that's going to lead the cells to stay larger. Similarly, folic acid is also a very important product in the way that DNA condenses, and as a result, the cell remains larger, and that's why it is microcytic. So these would result in basically a bigger cell with less hemoglobin in it, and as a result, we have a reduction in hemoglobin, and that would lead to the anemia. So these two types are from a reduction or a deficiency in these two types of vitamins. Finally, we go to the normocytic. Normocytic basically tells you we have an anemia, so we've got a reduction in red cells and hemoglobin, but the cells are of normal shape or normal volume. So what could lead to these? Well, you could have loss. So whole blood loss through hemorrhages would lead to a normocytic anemia. We could have hemolysis. So again, this could be the, the size of the cell is normal. Examples could be sickle cell anemia. So instead of the, the cell looking like a bioconcaved 
kind of like a donut. It's shaped like a half moon. Volume size, it's still normal, but it's poorly shaped, which leads to its hemolysis or it's being destructed in the body. Or we, as I said earlier, we could have an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme, changes its ability to handle free radicals and that leads to its destruction. But the size of the red blood cell is normal, so it's still in, in, in terms of the overall size of it, that doesn't change, but it still relates to these two, leads to their hemolysis or destruction, which decreases their amount, which is why they get the anemia. And finally, another cause of normocytic anemia is production problems. So we're not producing enough red blood cells. So an example here would be you're not stimulating the stem cell with EPO. So that, as I said earlier, that comes from the kidney. So if the kidney isn't working, so chronic kidney disease, it's not bringing EPO to the bone marrow. So that stops the stem cells not being told to make. Therefore, production levels go down. If production levels go down, red blood cells go down, we get anemia. But the, the ones that it does make are normal, so it's a normocytic cause, or we have a problem in the stem cell. So certain cancers, for instance, like leukemias, we may start to have malignancies developing within these stem cells. And so the overall number of good stem cells start to get crowded out and reduce in number. So there are less healthy stem cells, therefore the overall process drops and we develop a production caused anemia. But the cells or the red blood cells that are produced are still normal. So there we have it. That is a quick overview of anemia. Hopefully now you have got a good solid understanding of what it actually is by definition. We've gone through the basic physiology. We've looked at how your patients are likely to present what blood levels, when, you're, when you take the bloods, what they actually mean to give you an idea of the cause. And then how do we classify the cause based on the size of the red blood cell, whether it's microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic.